Hi, can you hear me? See me? Hi, sir. Good evening. I can hear you and see you both very well. And I hope you can hear your end as well. Yes, all good. All good. Okay. Great. Okay. Uh, so we have a fair number of people who've tuned in. So we can sure. start. Good evening, everyone who's joined in. Our today's session will be on the judicial reforms, uh, and we'll be especially zo zooming in on um, the recent debate that has sprung up uh, in the public sphere. And um, let me introduce you to our speaker for the evening. Uh, Mr. Alok Prasanna Kumar is co-founder and lead with the Karnataka. His areas of uh, research include judicial reforms, constitutional law, urban development, and law and technology. He writes a monthly column for the Economic and Political Weekly, and has published an Indian Journal of Constitutional Law and National Law School of India Review, apart from several other media outlets. A very, very warm welcome to you again, sir. Thank you so much, dear. My pleasure to be on this discussion. Pleasure to have you, sir. So, um, let's start off with the first question. Could you help us understand the evolution of the collegium system? For the appointment of the Supreme Court and High Court judges, especially with reference to the three judges case. Sure, the three judges case. Even before we go to the three judges case, there is a history to this. Right. And uh, those of you who want to read the longer version of this history, I would suggest you pick up this fantastic book by this American scholar called George H. Cadboys. It's about the appointment of judges to the Supreme Court of India between 1950 to 89. Under our constitution, the text of the constitution is very clear. Uh, you have for the appointment of judges, the president appoints Supreme Court judges upon consultation with the Chief Justice of India. Now the High Court judges, the, the president again appoints, but this time apart from the Chief Justice of India, they have to consult the Chief Justice of High Courts and the Governor of the state for which the High Court presides. So if it's Karnataka High Court, you consult the Governor of Karnataka. the chief justice of karnataka and upon that's the instant intent of the constitution right now right in the beginning from 1950 onwards at least till 1971 what george h gatboys points out is that jawaharlal jawaharlal nehru set up precedent he said whatever names are recommended by the chief justice of india we will appoint they at least the government's approach then was that judiciary should be independent should be seen to be independent they know who are the best independent judges whatever names they send we will appoint keep in mind this is a time when there was a lot of conflict between the judiciary and the executive over a lot of issues mm -hmm. but even then the principle that was maintained was that the whatever names you send to us we will appoint and the senior most judge we will make the chief justice of india there was only one time that the senior most judge did not become chief justice of india and it was actually something of a constitutional crisis because that particular judge was unwell and he was not in a position to be able to say i don't even want to be chief justice of india Special. so that was the only time this convention was not exactly followed okay but uh, i'll not get into that specifically so sure, sure. post 1971 there was a change in the way in which government approached uh, appointments the then indira gandhi government sort of said chief justice can send names but we will also say i have certain ideas for whom we think should be judges and we'll only approve the chief justice of india's names if we uh, if you accept our names also right and this was the process which was followed for the better part of two decades but this bargain break broke down this particular bar bargain of you send a few names i'll send a few names broke down when certain controversial names propped up certain names were not uh, uh, you know uh, appreciated by the either of the parties either the judiciary or the government and a lot of appointments were held up first judge's case basically came in the context of whether this particular method method of appointment is what does the consultation with the word consultation with the chief justice of india what does that mean in the constitution the first judge's cases supreme court controversially held that consultation does not mean concurrence government can appoint as long as they give, uh, give some credence to the views of the chief justice unlike with nehru's time they didn't say predominantly that person's view should only prevail or our view should prevail the court only said you take into account their views this so, didn't address the problem right uh, actually there is a podcast which goes into this in a lot more detail which has just come out 
it's called friend of the court okay. uh two episodes which go into this particular history behind the second and third judges cases they go into i will not uh, repeat that unnecessarily sure. but two such podcasts uh, two episodes go into it for those of you who are interested in seeing it in more detail please check that out yeah uh, again in the 1990s it was felt that the union government was exercising too much control over the appointments process names were not being cleared controversial appointments were taking places so you had a supreme court advocates on record association which approached the supreme court and said the judge the first judge's case was decided wrongly Con- uh, consultation should mean concurrence right okay. supreme court agreed supreme court in the second judge's case said that yes consultation has to mean concurrence but not just concurrence of one chief justice of india they said that it has to be chief justice of india plus two senior most judges yes right they created the what we now call the collegium system right and they said that, and they said that this is how the appointment should take place the memorandum of procedure they said normally when the when the court says when, when the three judges send a name government cannot simply refuse if they send back the uh, the court and if the court reiterates that name they have to appoint they put into place a lot of me- measures to ensure that the the recommendations of the judiciary would prevail in the appointment process mm-hmm. now this was once again it wasn't challenged but it was question i would like to say question because okay. that is what led to the third judges case in 1998 in this particular judgment the president made a reference to the supreme court asking a certain set of questions about the appointment process in this case the supreme court expanded the collegium from 3 to 5 judges that is for appointment to the supreme court there will be five senior most judges and any tra- appointment of a chief justice will also involve five senior most judges of a high court so they expanded the uh, judges in the that is the biggest change and they clarified a lot of other subsidiary points also in this respect because government said it only wanted clarifications it wasn't trying to overturn the process oh. so again i'm i'm simplifying a little bit here just to highlight the major changes Definitely. for those of you who would like the more specific points please do listen to this podcast called friend of the court uh, it goes into much more detail so you in 1999 this issue was sort of considered settled five senior judges of the supreme court of india would sit together send names for appointment of judges to the supreme court uh, for high court it was three senior judges of the supreme court plus three senior judges of the high court and the uh, final say was effectively the courts if the court reiterated the name the judge the, the uh, government had no choice but to appoint <coughs> this was what was formalized in the judgment and this was put into the memorandum of procedure which guides how appointments take place and these are the three judgments which created what we call the collegium uh, rather the two judgments which created the collegium system as we know it and which governed the way appointments would take place okay, okay as a follow up to what you've just said i would also want to dive into the constitutional aspect of it and article 124 of the constitution dealing with the appointment of the supreme court judges allowed the president read the executive almost to appoint judges after consulting the cgi or the chief justice of india and some other judges um the collegium system has significantly changed uh, this method of appointment uh, what was the judiciary's justification for overtaking the existing mechanism of appointment the justification that they offered was that we need to protect the independence of the judiciary okay the belief was that if the government has too much of a say it can influence the judiciary if it chooses too many people whom it has control over it will affect the independence of the judiciary and therefore we as judges should assert our control of the process and make sure only independent judges come through one i mean one, there are two broad justifications for this one is the fact that the government is the by far one of the largest litigants in before the courts in india i mean i'm talking about union government state government also quite significantly and the second part is that the court is the final interpreter of the constitution and if that gets it, it sort of is supposed to be this bulwark of rights is supposed to be uh, the counter majoritarian institution and if government captures that as well this institution will not be able to function appropriately right so and also if you look at the expertise part of it i mean uh, the collegium system would be much better qualified to appoint its judges 
rather than um, uh, an executive uh, which is not as well trained or as familiar with the terms of the laws not necessarily and, and again uh, in a sense this is a debatable proposition okay uh, it, it may have been true about 30 40 years ago when the pool of judges was limited Okay. Uh, there's a story, there's an anecdote of how uh, the then Chief Justice, the father of the current Chief of India, Justice Y.V. Chandrachud, he was considering a particular judge from Kerala for elevation to the Supreme Court. Okay. And he anonymously sat in that court once to see his performance, mm -hmm. uh, to see how he is as a judge. And then decided, yes, this person is good to be a judge. So it was possible when the judiciary was much smaller, perhaps, okay. uh, and they would know which judge we have appointed, why and for what purpose. Uh, but I don't know if that is still true. Okay. Or at least given that now, you know, you have about 600 odd judges in the high courts, right? apart from 30 odd judges in the Supreme Court, and you have tens of thousands of judges in the district court, mm -hmm. apart from the number of lawyers who are practicing in all the high courts. So you can't easily say these five people sitting in Delhi will know everything about who is the best candidate. They rely, of course, on their colleagues. Uh, but I wouldn't say, I wouldn't necessarily say that it is only judges will know who will be good judges, right? They may know a little bit more, but I will not make such a blanket statement, at least now, to say only judges will right. know who's a good judge. Right. I was just trying to put forward one of the common perceptions. And Correct. Thank you. For and and just, to take that, yeah, just to take that forward, I would understand it if there was clear criteria. Right. If the, if the criteria was delivers good judgments, right? Obviously... Mm -hmm. A Supreme Court is in, which sees a lot more judgments knows this is a good judgment, has shown independence in functioning, right? Mm -hmm. If you can come up with specific criteria to show how they have been independent, right? That how in major cases they've decided the cases. Uh, integrity is not something that judiciary can easily track because that is what needs input of uh, the police and the intelligence agencies, not to mention the income tax and other departments. So know what are the assets of this person? Have they increased, decreased? What was their behavior and so on and so forth? So different aspects, different agencies will be better positioned to say this. Yeah, absolutely, sir. Um, continuing, uh, my third question um, to you is that to improve the collegium system functioning, the Supreme Court directed the government to prepare and elaborate a MOP or a memorandum of procedure, like you mentioned. Uh, can you tell us more about this memorandum and its present status, which is being so heatedly sure. debated? So just for background, uh, this memorandum of procedure currently as it stands, and anybody can find this, not a secret document. Please go to the Ministry of Law website, the Department of Justice. You will find a memorandum of procedure and you can read it for yourselves. Uh, but when, in short, what it does is to try and prescribe how various kinds of the procedure to be followed and various appointments taken place. This was prepared after the third judge's case. Now, keep in mind, there is what is also called the fourth judge's case, which is the constitutionality of the NJAC legislation, the National Judicial Appointments Commission legislation, which was struck down by the Supreme Court, you will recall in his judgment in 2017. Now, in that context, the Supreme Court recognized that the process could be improved. Supreme Court didn't say the collegial system is perfect. It acknowledged that there are problems with the collegial system. These problems are raised during the arguments and the court said, yes, we think this needs improvement. They invited suggestions over a period of four weeks from civil society, the bar, government, everyone. A lot of suggestions were received. The court unfortunately did not follow it up. The court said, okay, okay, government, please, we've seen these suggestions. We have some suggestions for change. Please make changes to the memorandum of procedure. There's an order passed on certain aspects which they felt that the government should modify the memorandum of procedure. Unfortunately, that order remained unfulfilled. The particular, or rather uncomplied with. The order of the Supreme Court saying, please change the memorandum of procedure back in 2017 was not properly complied with uh, by the uh, government. Uh, 2016 was not fully complied with by the government. And that still remains unchanged. The memorandum of procedure remains unchanged. So which is where, that is where the controversy happened. This was pointed out recently in proceedings in the Supreme Court as well, that there was an earlier order to amend the memorandum of procedure, but the government has not complied with it. Can the court meet the government to comply with it? That is an open question. So that is where, that is where we stand. Right. 
and it's got uh, caused significant friction between the two institutions as well because there's a lot of back and forth that's going on that we get to read in the papers um okay so you also mentioned in your epw article that by condoning the union government's power to segregate nominations the supreme court collegium has effectively converted itself into a search and selection committee uh could you elaborate on how this impacts the objectivity of appointments so let's take one step back now we just saw that the four judges case said up a struck down and said collegium system is fine but it needs a few amendments no changes took place but controversially the government started behaving differently what they started doing was if a list of five judges was sent they would approve four and leave out the fifth person or they would appoint the fifth person at a later point of time nothing in the memorandum of procedure or in any of the judges cases is gives the government the power to segregate appointments like this right it is not just a matter of administrative convenience because one of the most important criteria for appointment of judges is seniority okay. that is my seniority is counted from the date on which i am appointed not my age it's yeah. counted from the date on which i am appointed so when the court sends five names it intends for these five names to be appointed on the same date mm-hmm. the first instance of this happening publicly from what i am aware uh, was with uh, justice uh, korean uh, sorry uh, justice joseph of the supreme court okay. right uh, when his name was suggested uh, to the supreme court they appointed the other three people along who were also recommended but his they delayed by a few months so he lost a few months of seniority but this has happened repeatedly although the supreme court somewhat feebly protested they didn't do anything much much in the next 5 years the supreme court doesn't even protest oh you see many instances of judges uh, suggested to the high courts supreme court doesn't happen that much justice the judges suggested to the high courts who out of seven names three get appointed to get appointed later and two are returned mm-hmm. this is this segregation is not supposed to happen in accordance with the memorandum of procedure okay. and the, because this gives the government control right. but the problem that i'm raising is that the collegium did not push back the collegium did not say that you can't do this or stop doing it or did not even use its or even you know like in the judicial side use its power to say no we will not recognize this mm-hmm. so this is something that the collegium tolerated and effectively that changed the process itself as my article in the epw shows uh, this has happened to at least 40 different judges right uh, and 21 have actually lost seniority as a result of these kinds of changes so in that way in that way this means that the collegium's word is not final mm-hmm. it means that and 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 i am not going to come to the second part of this kind of segregation where the government even after the court reiterates even after the collegium reiterates it refuses to appoint those judges yeah. we see that has happened with the number of multiple judges a list was recently shared with the uh, court uh, by uh, the campaign for, by mr prashant bhushan for for the campaign for judicial accountability and uh, research which i am also a part of i am an executive member of that uh, the list of judges whose names are pending who have been reiterated when you re- remember according to the memorandum of procedure if a judge's name is reiterated you have to appoint you have no choice but the government is refusing to take action there are some names they have returned for a second time saying we ignore your reiteration and that is not acceptable unfortunately the collegium has not enforced its writ the collegium has not said you cannot do this according to the memorandum of procedure stop doing it and by its actions the collegium has acquiesced to this situation so effectively what has happened and this is why i say the collegium has turned itself into a search and selection committee it sends a list of names to the government government picks a few names from those list appoint some reject some appoint some at some other later point of time the government is now deciding who will get to become a judge the government is now deciding who will get to become a judge at what point of time and the government is now effectively determining seniority for future consideration as uh, for elevation and so on and so forth so which is where i i sort of feel that the collegium is that itself is not working as a collegium system the system has effectively been changed mm-hmm. because you're not following some of the core rules of that system mm-hmm. so maybe five judges are sitting together over a cup of tea and sending some names but the way in which the government 
government is supposed to function, they are not holding the government to the letter of the law. That is the problem. That, that's uh, that's quite scary actually to think of because essentially the collegium system is the only filter that we have today for appointments and for the law keeping of the country so it's 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 incredibly important how that due process is followed um on a parallel issue that i want to raise is the issues of vacancy that you take up uh, in your articles as well and you've contended that um the collegium system has been largely incapable of ensuring that an adequate number of appointments is made across courts to reduce the number of vacancies quickly. How can this be overcome? Uh, on the other hand, we also have the government who as per Supreme Court's observation is sitting over, like you mentioned, appointment of collegium recommended judges as it did not like the nullification of the National Judicial Appointments Commission. So let's start with what's the problem with the collegium system. Um, it, it, again, the size of the judiciary has changed dramatically from the 1990s to what we see today. I, I had written an article for Mint back in 2015, 16 if I'm not mistaken, okay. where I looked at about a decade's worth of data and saw that consistently, the co like so every year a certain number of high court judges and Supreme Court judges retire and a certain number are appointed. Now, mm -hmm. if, you just appoint, if you just fill up those appointments and retirements, you won't be able to fill the vacancies right. because there are always vacant posts. You have to actually appoint far more people than who retire to be able to actually make a dent in the vacancy. Hmm. Now, the high court in India is where the, the largest pendency is. When I say largest, I don't mean absolute number of cases. Okay. The maximum number of cases per judge is actually at the high court level. Right. Hmm. This is by far the level where there is most inefficiency and most difficulty in disposing cases for a variety of reasons. Because they have the widest jurisdiction, in fact, even wider than the Supreme Court. And they serve very, very large states right. Right, in terms of economy, in terms of population and so on. So the government has been increasing the number of sanctioned posts for high court judges year on year, not year on year, over the years. I think currently the number stands at around 1100 or so. But yeah, ever since the collegium system came into the picture, no matter what the capacity of, no matter the total number of judges sanctioned, they have never been able to have more than 700 or 720 judges in the high court at any given point of time, which means okay. there is a problem with the system. Now, part of this is also constitutional because keep in mind, remember what I said first, appointing Supreme Court judges straightforward. See, President consults CJ. Mm -hmm. Appointing appointing judges to the district court is very straightforward. Governor appoints based on what the high court says. So nowadays in most states, it is a mix of direct recruitment and promotion. Right? If you want to be appointed a magistrate or a district judge, there are clear rules. Most of the time, they're able, except for three or four states, a lot of states don't have too many vacancies. There are some, but not too many. High court is most complicated because it involves four authorities. The Chief Justice of India, President, Governor, and the uh, Chief Justice of the High Court. Right? So effectively, state and central government have to agree, and the Chief Justice of, and the Collegium of the Supreme Court and High Courts have to agree. Now, we find that in a lot of instances, delays can happen at every level. The chief justice of a high court may not know the high court well enough to send a lot of names. Or they send the names, the high court, the, the chief, the state government may sit on it. Then the names get sent to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court collegium needs to convene, decide it, and then appoint. Then the, uh, what do you call the union government, right? This process can take two years, effectively. Uh, unless there are some, there are some uh, unless somebody really cleans up the system or does such a fantastic job or uh, recommends candidates, nobody can have a question about this. Mm -hmm. pro this process can take some time. Now, this need not take so much time, even with the four authorities. If you set clear timelines, right? Okay. If chief justices of high courts are told send these names every sec x number of months, or if the chief minister or the state government is told send your comments within one month or we assume you have nothing to say hmm. or if the collegium fits regularly. I remember there was a time when the collegium met on a weekly basis uh, to take these calls, but that practice was stopped after a while. Uh, I don't know if that practice will be resumed. See, this needs structure. 
this needs structure and rules and unfortunately the collegium system works too informally right it depends on the chief justice to call for the meetings mm. depends on justice on the judges managing their schedules it depends on the paperwork i mean this was recently mentioned by chief justice it is basically one person who's coordinating all of this in the supreme court register appointments is a serious process right mm-hmm. it needs a bunch of people who have access to all the information who keeps track of all the suggestions that are going where they're going who is being recommended how long who is taking ensuring meetings happen on time agenda is kept recommendations are sent and it's it's i mean i will not say the central government has not delayed the process they have definitely delayed the process they have not responded in a lot of cases that is absolutely true but they are not the only ones and this may be it might not be fair to blame only the union government on this right the collegium does not work very efficiently the collegium uh, and i mean both the high court and the supreme court the state governments can sometimes delay the process unfortunately this is a problem i talk about later we don't have transparency we don't know on what date high court sent its recommendations to the state government and then to the uh, supreme court and then to the government so we don't if we had more data we'd be able to say actually this is the problem and this is how you can fix it mm-hmm. we don't know where the problem lies essentially yeah. Yeah. okay uh, uh that's 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 very <laughs> that's scary again because um again these delays are 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 showing up they're cropping up in the pendency of cases right it, it has a yeah. ripple effect it's not working even yeah. isolated um so you also illustrate through data on how collegium has become a self selecting clique could you break down uh, break that down yeah. for us so I- under the constitution to become a high court judge you can you either need to be a lawyer with a, about 10 years of experience mm-hmm. or you need to be a district judge who has been a district judge for a certain number of years um these are two pools by by which the court recruits high court judges right or rather the process recruits high court judges mm-hmm. unfortunately what, what was earlier believed that was to be a minimum threshold that you should 33% of judges should come from the uh, district judiciary i'll call them the district judiciary because that's a better term okay that has become a ceiling somebody has interpreted to me no more than one third of judges should come from the district judiciary because mm-hmm. here you have people who have invested already have invested a lot of time in the system you should be giving them a lot of opportunity Absolutely. you should be showing sure to perform well we'll put you in the high court mm-hmm. but unfortunately only they are competing essentially only for one third of positions on the other hand you have lawyers who with sufficient practice can be considered eligible for the appointment to the high court mm-hmm. now keep in mind in almost every single state there are reservations for the district judiciary okay okay and how much they are filled is a different matter but there are reservations mm-hmm. this automatically means the most diverse part of our judiciary is actually the district judiciary right this is data which people are still studying and there's a fantastic series of articles in the print by jyoti uh, singh the journalist right uh, five articles on women and the troubles they face when they go to the when they become judges uh, in the lowest levels magistrate and so on what's fascinating is the social change that it represents right none of these places have seen a woman in power at all right or at least it is the systems and the society are not able to deal with it and this is happening at a large scale these are women are not exceptions there's a, pla- a place like meghalaya 60% of the nearly 70% of the uh, subordinate judiciary are women and i'm pretty sure in the next decade at least 50% without too much effort at least 50% of the subordinate judiciary will be women but they have, there is a glass ceiling for them right one is women and two because they belong to the subordinate judiciary they are competing for very small number of seats in the high court mm-hmm. additionally they they their performance is always assessed analyzed there is clear record right to say have they done a good job bad job somebody is assessing them a high court or a, another judge is assessing them to so say that it's called the annual confidential report they are assessed at every single year to say they done a good bad whatever there's a set of rankings and you look at those rankings you look at their asset declarations you look at everything and say this person is good to be a high court judge or not 
Unfortunately for lawyers, there are no such clear demarcations, yeah. right? There may be some informal criteria, but nobody says it out loud. Yeah. They take into account your income as a way of do you have good enough practice. They take into account how many cases you kind of argued. They take into account the vague and infamous intel information. Sorry, intelligence bureau reports, and say, okay, maybe this person will be good as a judge. Um, they take into account government's uh, inputs on this because usually somebody who is a government lawyer is generally assumed to be okay, probably reasonably good at their job. Okay. But they are not being assessed in a rigorous way. Right. But there is a problem with the pool also. The legal profession suffers from a serious survivorship issue. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a process that even uh, Adam Smith talks about in his theory of the wealth of nations, mm -hmm. where he says that essentially one lawyer tends to make as much money as twenty lawyers put together, right? Yeah. Whereas, let's say maybe that's not true for a software engineer. The average software engineer they may be ten, fifteen, twenty percent up and down. The average academic fifteen, twenty percent depending on which university. If you have approximately the same level. But lawyers of about 10-15 years practice, one will probably make as much as 20 others put together, right. because what uh, the profession itself does not have a structured way of promoting talent. So, and in India, that means those with connections, especially of family, of caste, of religion, are able to have a stronger footing in the profession, right? right. Not to say nobody else will make it. Extremely talented, extremely hardworking people will succeed everywhere. But those with a family in the profession or who belong to the right caste networks, right religious networks, you know, get that additional ten steps in this race. Right. They start. The start, starting point is twenty steps ahead. Right. If you are very good, you will catch up with. Them. And I know many people who have. Right. So that pool is very narrow, because for most people, if you are not going to make money in the first two or three years in this profession, you will starve. Right. There are no easy opportunities for you to succeed in the profession. Right. So what happens is if you are looking today at the pool of people to be appointed as judges, mm -hmm. looking at somebody with say 15 to 20 years experience, you will find that they will mostly be upper caste men. Now increasingly a few more women who have had connections to the profession, who had somebody in the family in the profession, and who have the wealth. That the privileges and the connections to survive in the profession. Right. So your pool is very narrow. Now what happens? There's an additional factor for this. What happens is that somebody, when they're considering a lawyer for appointment, even if you say 20 years of experience, that lawyer is in their mid 40s. On the other hand, for the district judiciary, they're in their mid 50s by the time that they are considered. So, and this is what my data shows. This is a 2016 article I wrote for APW. Uh, what my data shows is that if the other part of the glass ceiling is that even though you're competing for only one third of the seats, those from the district judiciary tend to have much shorter tenure in the court and they have much less seniority by the time they retire, which means they never get to be part of the selection process. Keep in mind to be in the collegium, you have to be the, one of the three senior most judges. Yeah. So what happens is this lawyer from the male lawyers with an upper caste background end up as the senior most judges of the high court. They end up in the collegium and they end up selecting other male senior upper caste lawyers to the high court. Now, not to say this is very generalizable across the board. There are exceptions. People have made it across the system. People have found ways to stand out and shine and people have reached out in different ways to appoint a diverse bench. But this doesn't happen systematically. Right. In fact, the numbers are, I mean, the numbers are up to 1989, but look at the uh, annexure in George Gadboy's book about the composition of the Supreme Court of India. This was the composition of the bench which decided the second judge's case, okay. which put in place the collegium system, right? Yeah. And in effect, it has perpetuated a certain kind of clique hmm. of people with sufficient ability to survive in the profession thanks to connections not to say no, no ability they have ability you have had good lawyers also oh. but it gives them a, a systemic systemically they enjoy an advantage that those who may not have those connections will not enjoy. Yeah. so what this means is that the same kind of people keep selecting the same kind of people right. and additionally because there are no criteria nothing which says tell us why this person became a judge 
tell us why this person was not considered right. it becomes complete arbitrariness right. Right. maybe we'll have good chief justices who will appoint good judges but there's no way to ensure that the average person picked out as a judge of the high court will act will actually be you know i mean we will act, i mean we'll ensure that there is diversity in the bench right so that no nobody's concerned with trying to address this diversity problem and in fact the collegiate system in fact perpetuates a certain set of clique old boys club so to speak in the appointments process right and and perpetually there's also no sense of answerability that you have in the system Correct. yes so, and 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 this this sort of this sort of comes up all the time when a judge enters into a scandal um we we we've seen with justice uh, c s karnan we have seen uh, with uh, just uh, justice chatta chatterjee if i'm not mistaken from the uh, calcutta high court uh, earlier uh, there was uh, justice um, uh, p d dinakar uh, prema kumar who also was in the middle of a lot of controversy it it, it sort of begs this question and and recently we've had controversies over a lot of appointments and transfers you've had judges who got transferred essentially as punishment postings and there have been protests by the bar i mean most recently we saw that, that the gujarat high court bar protested against the proposed transfer of justice nikhil karyal menon uh, likewise the telangana and andhra pradesh bar protested the transfer of uh, justice dev dev that if i'm not mistaken uh, so you 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 do see that that because there is no accountability there is no need to explain there is no accountability mm -hmm. right so which is which is where it means that it it feels and this is how perhaps the best way to put it is it feels for an outsider that this is just a club of men picking men like themselves largely right um you uh, also uh, in in um, you know following up to what you said till now i'm just curious that in the collegium versus njac debate is there one system which scores over the other or do you think we should look for a more efficient and inclusive alternative i think both are bad options i mean when i say njac i mean the version which was drafted by the union government and passed by parliament then struck down like both the constitution amendment and the law i think they were both unfortunately the bad way to approach it because they asked the wrong question to me the question of the most important question is how should judges be appointed not who should appoint exactly. right the whole collegium and in versus njac is focused only on one part which is who are the people who will make the decision that is an important part it's not the only thing the process matters as much the process starting from can be set out criteria on suitability of a judge to be made judge of a high court or the supreme court can we set out goals for the judiciary to meet diversity criteria can we say i mean it, it, it cannot be called reservation because reservation applies in a system which has regular uh, appointments whereas here it, it is vacancy based can we create a system where the judiciary says we want to ensure x percentage of representation for women for dalits for adivasis and other excluded communities in india right can we sort of say that uh, we would like to encourage first time lawyers right first generation lawyers uh to become judges and some of the best lawyers judges in this country have been first generation lawyers i cannot think of anyone better than the late justice uh, uh, sh kapadia uh, who effectively at his life story is kind of inspiring that way he started off as a court clerk a court clerk picking the bags of a lawyer because he, he had to drop out of college so that he could work because his father died and worked his way up he worked his way up the hard way and became a lawyer without any family pedigree without any this thing and so on so I, and so i i'd say i'd say something like that uh, can the court say, tell us we would like to encourage people to be like this. we would like to encourage people to feel that they have a chance at being a judge um and then set out a transparent process tell us who meet who met this criteria right. why are you sending the name forward then come to the question of who will finally appoint and in this situation i think other countries which kind of have a judicial appointment commission which is a mix of definitely judges have to be involved because they will know the judiciary better right definitely the government has to be involved because they will know what they will have the information about a judge or a potential candidate that the judiciary and others may not have and the third i believe should be civil society the civil society ideally should be members of the bar 
or perhaps even any any eminent person however you want to define it eminent person that person should be the representative of the citizens of india right i mean not that we have to vote for them no uh, it has to be someone who is there in the room as to remind the judiciary and the government that you are appointing judges for the benefit of the people not for yourselves absolutely right? you are, this is not some cozy chat between the government and the judiciary to you know pick judges this is a important public function being conducted for the benefit of citizens so it is important to have either from the bar or from civil society at some level some representation like and this should be replicated both at the central and the state level right if you are sending it it should be it it simplifies the process so there is one judicial appointment commission at the state they pick names send it to the national one cleared a president appoints for supreme court national judiciary picks the uh, commission picks the names sends it to president appoints lots of countries have come up with variations of this uh, in different compositions and so on and so forth but i think we should break out of this government versus judiciary approach because that is not helping who eventually the judiciary is for the judiciary is at the end of the day for us it is for the citizens of india to be able to have a recourse and a remedy so in that sense what i would say is that we, are, we we should look for this third alternative and that alternative is doesn't just focus on who but also the how the how is the most important part if you ask me the how there is enormous scope for simplification improving efficiency improving uh, uh, transparency in the process improving objectivity in the process so if people feel confident right and i'll give you an example the, i mean the example that most people are likely to be familiar with is the united states of america mm-hmm. the executive government picks the nominees no no involvement of judiciary at all executive government picks the nominees yes yeah. but they are put through the process you will know you know as we say across the janam kundli of that judge mm-hmm. whatever they have done in life everything is public and if you are not willing to expose yourself it is believed you are not fit to be a judge sure if you are not not willing to expose your life to such scrutiny you're not fit to be a judge so yes you can say maybe some judges have stronger ideologies towards the party that they represent other judges have ideology but it's not like the judges are immediately they're trying to figure out what the government wants them to do and does it right nobody says that the federal judiciary or even the state judiciary in the united states they may have ideologies i'm not saying judges shouldn't have ideologies everybody has ideologies it's a lie to believe that judges don't come with ideologies they do and it's okay as long as there is balance on the bench as long as it is not dominated by exactly one kind of ideology that is also dangerous okay. so the balance is okay as long as they adhere to the law as long as they sort of decide cases according to their convictions according to their own independent thinking that's fine mm-hmm. right so even though in the us it's just government picking placing before the uh, congress Well, not even the congress senate only the senate yeah having them go through those hearings and having it cleared it's so transparent everything is discussed everything is made known that you can say yes you know and they, they make it very explicit when they say we want a diverse judiciary they say yes we will appoint a black woman right they will say hey, yes we want a latina woman yes we want a white woman or whoever else it is right maybe in the future they may be they may say explicitly we want a judge who is openly gay sure and or openly transgender or whatever it is so that that should be clear and that should be something that you want your judiciary to be so which is where i feel if you solve for the how the who is not so important the who will you know like it is an important part but it's not that independence will die or uh, save if if government appoints or judiciary appoints or so on and so forth so i believe this third option which is what i have just described i think that may be a better way to go about it yeah and i completely agree with you when you say the who um takes a back seat as compared to the how because um the who is very important in the present context but the context will keep on changing and people will keep on replacing people but the system decides finally who gets the seat um and and that doesn't change for a long time and uh, that has to keep evolving with the context um yeah. okay um so my question is also so with respect to what you just discussed in your 
uh, example through the US that there's a lack of diversity, especially with reference to the denominators of caste and gender in high courts. As the most diverse pool of applicants uh, from the subordinate judiciary are less represented and have little opportunity to influence future appointments as well. Can you explain how the uh, collegium system by itself reduces these opportunities for the judges um, from the subordinate ju judiciary? Right. So going back to that article which I described, uh, which I talked about, which I wrote about in 2016. Uh, at that time, I looked at the 100 senior most high court judges across the country. Right. This is people who are most likely on the collegium of their respective high courts or they are in contention to be appointed to the Supreme Court or to become a chief justice of another high court. Mm -hmm. Even though one third or 30 percent of all judges of the high court were from the district judiciary, only three out of the hundred were from the, the district judiciary. And this data, I mean, I haven't updated the data. I need to check it once again. I don't think it has changed fundamentally. If anything, it might have even become worse. Um, if you sort of see, there have been in the Supreme Court itself, there have been no more than a handful of judges who have had uh, experience of the subordinate judiciary. I think the last judge subject to correction was probably Justice Bhanumati, uh, who had actually worked her way up the judicial system. Uh, and when, once she retired, I don't think that currently, the, as far as I know, the Supreme Court does not have a judge who has come up from the district judiciary. They are either judges like Justice Narsimha, who was appointed uh, as because he was a practicing lawyer of the Supreme Court, or they have been judges of the High Court. Uh, as far as I know, and as far as I, I have checked with the biographies of judges, I do not think any one of them have been in the district judiciary and gotten appointed to the uh, High Court. So this means here is a large pool of people, again, possibly the most diverse pool of people who you're not choosing from and you're not choosing from from very arbitrary considerations because when they are considered for district judiciary their practice as lawyers is thrown out right right if i'm practice if i practice as a lawyer for 20 years that counts as 20 years of practice but if i practice as a lawyer for 15 years and then i write the judicial service exam and i become a district judge all my 15 years gets wiped out and i'm now counted from year zero right. so by the time i get another 15 years I'm 10 years older than the person of the same cohort, right? Hmm. So to take a hypothetical example uh, of two people, let's say, who join practice on the same date, literally, the person who chooses to wait 20 years to become a high court judge, will get appointed at the age of 40. But somebody who tries to write the, say, entrance exam to become a magistrate and then a district judge, each time their experience gets we uh, uh, you know lost so which is where i think that has to change i think the collegium has to this, this is a conscious choice it needs to be made right there is nothing sacred about the numbers that they're using all of them are made up okay. all of them are fairly arbitrary it's because you've put so much weight on seniority you use these numbers but if you consciously say we want a diverse judiciary we want to be able to ensure that our high courts have at least 50% of judges from the subordinate judiciary or the district judiciary, then you can make it happen. Unfortunately, there are prejudices about this. And you will hear these prejudices if you go to any court. Mm -hmm. Lawyers will dismiss judges who come from the district judiciary saying, hey, they don't know this law, hey, they don't know that law. They've been judged in some small uh, district. What will they know about this? What will they know about that? Which is unfair, which is unfair and privileges a certain kind of knowledge over the others. It's not that objectively they're bad. The greatest judge India has probably had in its post-independent history, Justice H.R. Karna, who wrote the dissenting judgment in ADM Jabalpur, came up from the district judiciary. And, you know, even though people admire him, there is always that he was very good. But for a district judge, he was also very good. So, you know, there are even that people can't let go. So I think um, in that sense, that oh, prejudice has to be overcome. You have to consciously say we will give people that opportunity. And look at the profile of case in the high court, right? Uh, high courts are dealing with bail applications. High courts are dealing with uh, civil appeals. High courts are dealing with criminal appeals. High courts are dealing with transfer cases. None of these require like some great knowledge of law. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to kind of 
understand the matter at hand, decide quickly. In fact, the counter to what I just said, a good friend of mine pointed out. He said, I actually appreciate judges from the district judiciary because they don't get bogged down in the details too much. A lawyer who is always trying to master all the details never ends up deciding a case. A judge who has practiced passing orders on a day-to-day -day basis knows what's the main question. How do I answer this? And I will answer this question. Right or wrong? That will at a higher court and decide whatever is fine. But they are what he called disposal oriented. They know I need to be done with this case and it's possible. So in the interest of the system itself, if we are talking about we have such a crushing burden of uh, pendency before us and of course the fact that you know we don't have a diverse judiciary that much, I think this is what the college system needs to do or whatever system of apartment we choose, it has to give more and greater opportunities to judges in the district judiciary to become high court judges. Right. Uh, one audience member has also asked if... Um... Uh, if judges can be appointed the same way as IAS and IPS officers in this country are selected? So this is this is something which gets discussed a lot. I've actually written an article in the Hindu a few years ago, 2018, I think. Uh, this, this, this is like a, a All India Judicial Service. Personally, currently, it, it, that's what happens at the state level, hmm. right? So if you want to become a magistrate or a district judge, you write an exam. You clear the exam, you sit for an interview, you're appointed, you're transferred all over the state. At the state level, that is what happens. And I think that's a good idea. That should be continued. At the high court level, there is a problem. And that problem comes to the fact that or, or across states is very difficult to do for the simple reason that uh, unlike with all IAS officers who eventually are ma ma managed centrally, right. there are too many... The, each state is managed by the high court. Right? It cuts out the high courts of the process. Mm. So say a judge who has been in uh, UP for 10 years, gets suddenly transferred to say Madhya Pradesh, mm -hmm. then a different authority is seeing all his performances. That doesn't happen with IAS officers, by the way. It's very, very rare that that happens. Yeah. So I don't think that the, the district level, it's a good idea to keep moving people between states. And more importantly, there's the language factor. Uh, IAS officers, they learn the language, that is true, yeah. but legal language is something else. Very, very different. Right? Yes. It, it is very different. And even, say, in a state like Karnataka, where I am right now, a lot of judges struggle with the change in dialect also. They struggle with change in the way people speak a certain language also. Right. So, which is, which is where there are serious obstacles. So, I don't think... So, what is being done at the state level, I think, is fine. And the high court level, there is a different problem. The, at the high court level, currently judges are being transferred. They are being transferred from one to the other. The difficulty is that you can, uh, knowing the context of the local laws is very important. To give you an example, sixth schedule areas and fifth schedule areas. Mm -hmm. right? If you are a lawyer who has practiced in, say, the Northeast or a lawyer who's practiced in the uh, Chota Nagpur tribal belt in the East, you will will be extremely familiar with those laws. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who be transferred to those states as judges struggle to catch up. Right. Likewise, the other way around. If you're somebody, so which is why there was an earlier proposal that one third of judges in any high court should be from outside the state. But it was not found feasible. It, it wasn't found feasible. And they found that, in fact, transfer was seen as punishment. Right. Right, it doesn't really improve the efficiency of the judiciary, and it also affects the independence. So, in some senses, see, unlike with an IAS officer, where at the age of 25, 26, you are basically told if you're being allocated to that state, you will work for the next whatever years in the state, and maybe move to Delhi. If, as a judge in your 40s and 50s, you have to uproot yourself from state to state and go, it's a problem. A lot of judges do it voluntarily, but they don't if a, a transfer which is not voluntary is oftentimes seen as punishment unless you're being given a higher posting as chief justice. So I don't think so. And frankly, even the IAS system, I'm not sure it has promoted independence of IAS officers. There are very talented, very hardworking, very able officers. I'm 100% sure. But if you see the rate at which IAS officers are becoming politicians, including in various, not just at the central level, at the state level also, right. you would want to question like, you know, don't you see, you should, shouldn't you be like 
agnostic to who is in power hmm. right so all of that i would say that that, that is not necessarily see, that is a system which also came in a colonial context let's not be too enamored with that system also sure. right that is a system which was imposed in a colonial context at least we can say at present judiciary has a constitutional context and so on let's not assume that ias is a good way I, I, i honestly don't see what problem it will solve because i have in that article which i wrote in the hindu i've shown appointments in ias are create as many vacancies as in the judiciary maybe 2 3% here that might change uh, it does lead to new problems in the respect of getting context of local laws getting context of local uh, conditions and situation and like i said there may be issues with independence also if you feel that you know you can easily get transferred like an ias officer from one to the other that will also be problematic mm-hmm. so which is which is where i i i i that it's, it's i'm not sure that's a solution i think as it stands the good analogy is with the district judiciary there i think the system works the system of write an exam get through an interview you can be transferred anywhere but within the same state all monitored by the high court i think that's perfectly fine but even there there are concerns of independence which i think need to be addressed you've had chief justice chandrachud say this in the in public dy chandrachud say this in public that high court should not treat the district judiciary as subordinate to them they should treat them as equal constitutional functionaries so i think there are issues there but it may work a little bit better in that context rather than the high court context. right Okay, so I think we've su- surpassed the time that we had set out with. Uh, yeah. But uh, this this has been an incredible session, sir. Thank you for all your fact-filled uh, points and insights that you've brought forward. And it's a there's there's a lot that we need to think over that uh, we can draw from this discussion. Uh, so thank you for to, to everyone who's tuned in very patiently till now. And um, if you wish to read, uh, sir's many many articles. on the epw uh, they are uh, available on our website um you uh, at this point i would also request you to please subscribe to the epw and um thank you again very much sir have a great evening thanks thanks dear thank you have a great evening and thank you everyone for joining the discussion thank you sir thank you